Welcome, everybody. My name is Jay Ingram. Uh, it's very dangerous to put a person like me who's been in the media in the position of introducing myself because we could go on for a while. However, I'm here to MC this meeting. Um, it's, there are, I, please reassure me, there are some people in here that are not glycomic scientists. Thank you. My <laughs> remarks are aimed at you. Uh, the scientists will tell you all about glycomics. First though, before we begin, uh, we're at the University of Alberta, obviously. The university acknowledges we're on Treaty 6 territory, which if you don't know, is a broad swath of land encompassing central Alberta and central Saskatchewan. And before the hard lines of provincial boundaries were drawn, this was a place, a gathering place for many indigenous groups, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, Ashinaabe, and Inuit. And we should remember and respect that. So the format is following. We have a large group of uh, impressive scientific talent. Our goal here is if you came in not knowing anything about glycomics, you would leave knowing a lot more. And even if you know a lot about glycomics, I'm pretty sure you will take away things that you didn't know at this moment. So we're going to have three short speeches to start. This Mine is one. Then a panel of six people, very rapid fire, some time for questions from the floor, and then a reception. No scientific gathering is complete without a reception. Glycomics, of course, is a study of sugar molecules, sugars bonded to other sugars, and sugars bonded to other kinds of molecules, and then the roles that this vast catalog of molecules plays in health and disease. So, for instance, take proteins. I know a lot of protein scientists, they really think proteins are the engines of life, and indeed, they are the structural components of most living things, and of course, enzymes propel living things, chemical reactions. But they're usually decorated with sugar molecules. Then you have glycoproteins. There are also glycolipids. There are glycosamino, glycosaminoglycans. There are glycosylphosphatidylinositol, GPI, anchored glycoproteins. So you get the picture. But, you know, as a science communicator, I always want to know, what, what does this all look like? And of course, it's on a fantastically tiny scale. So if I had a one crystal of sucrose, common table sugar here, it would contain 1.6 times 10 to the 17th sugar sucrose molecules. So what does this all look like? Okay, well there's sucrose, glucose and fructose uh, linked together. For a non-scientist that's not very informative, but of course that's only one way. You could show it like this, you could show it like that. I think what's more important is not so much the actual structures, of course they're, they're very important for the science, but to give you a context, the arena in which these uh, play out, I want to take you on a little trip through a cell. And not just, actually a tiny piece of a cell. So imagine that's actually probably about a tenth of the circumference of a human cell. Starting at the right, you have the nucleus, and then that red bar goes across from the nucleus through the cytoplasm, cytoplasm to the cell membrane. This is a series of paintings done by a friend of mine named David Goodsell at the Scripps Institute. So if you go in close, and what I'm trying to convey here is the incredible complexity of this subject. So there we are in the nucleus. You can see that DNA is wrapped around uh, histone proteins but some of it is being transcribed in the upper right. You move through the nuclear membrane and into the cytoplasm full of ribosomes, countless kinds of molecules, all of which, or many of which, are linked to sugars or strings of sugars called glycans. You get uh, part of a mitochondria in here. I know it's kind of bewildering to see it this tight, but I mean, this is what the scale of life really is. There's a Golgi apparatus on the right-hand side, busy packaging proteins and linking them to sugar molecules. And then as you move out through the cytoplasmic space, there are the um, structural proteins, uh, the supporting network of the cell. And finally, 
you get to the cell membrane on the outside. And note the um, conifer-like extensions, the green parts on the outside. The cell membrane, which is, of course, where the cell interacts with its surroundings, where materials are exported from the cell and other materials are imported. It's, uh, and then remember from the original diagram, this piece that we're looking at of the cell membrane would probably be equivalent to the area of Alberta on the globe. So it's a tiny piece, and yet in that image, there are likely tens if not hundreds of millions of proteins linked to sugars. There's really no example of a living cell that is not coated with glycans, with sugar molecules. They're the first point of contact with other cells, first line of defense against bacterial infection. They're involved in protein folding, protein trafficking through the cell, tuning the immune system, and they define the outward facing parts of cells. And yet, the timing of their creation and destruction, and most important, most important, the complete la list of tasks they perform is still largely unknown. But obviously, when these sugars are intimately bound up in every single cell in our bodies, the normal workings of those, any imperfections have major consequences for health, and that's the science that we're talking about today. I'd first like to introduce now Dr. Todd Lowry, chemist here at the U of A, scientific director of Glyconet. That is a national center of excellence. He has a special interest in deciphering the role of glycans in mycobacterium tuberculosis, but he's here today to talk a little bit about the history of glycomics in Canada and the role of Glyconet. Dr. Lowry. Thank you very much. So um, as many of you are aware, I moved to Canada about 15 years ago. Uh, and one of the main reasons I moved here from the US was that I thought this was a better place to do glycoscience. And that was in part because there was a long tradition across the country in this field, uh, and particularly in Alberta. And so I, I'll, I'll focus a bit first about Alberta. Uh, earlier this week, we had the RU Lemieux Lecture in Biotechnology, which honors, uh, I guess, the person who really started everything here in Alberta, uh, Raymond Lemieux. And so that was a sort of a, a good remembrance of, of, of the impact that, that Ray had on, on the community. Uh, so Ray started here in 1961 and built up a, a program in initially carbohydrate chemistry, which led into carbohydrate biochemistry. And then uh, Professor David Bundle, who's here with us today, was, was, was an early postdoc with Ray. Uh, over the years, more and more people, Oli Hinsgall, Monica Palsik, David came back from, from NRC. And then over the last 15 years, we've really done a lot of expansion here in terms of hiring people uh, to support this activity. That sort of uh, community building has actually happened all across the country in various centers. So the University of Toronto has a big strength in, in, in the area of carbohydrate chemistry and biology. Certainly the University of British Columbia does as well. People like Stephen Withers and uh, his former student, David Vocato, now is at the University of uh, Simon Fraser University, also in the Greater Vancouver area. So there's been a really a concentrated effort over, over many years to really build up uh, strength in this area. Um, David created the Alberta Glycomic Center uh, 15 years, 16 years ago. Uh, and uh, in 2015, uh, or 14, we, we made the argument to the federal government that we'd had success in Alberta making a successful research network or research organization that really made an impact, created companies, uh, developed intellectual property and trained students that with the mass of people we had across the country, we could, we could achieve that on a national scale. Uh, and so that was the pitch we made to the federal government in 2015. Uh, and it was successful, and so we, the Glyconet started in 2015, and it sort of now serves as the, the group that, that supports uh, the, the community as a whole and speaks sort of in, to the international community about the importance of glycomics. Um, and we're now gearing up for our renewal, and we hope that we can move forward and continue to expand on the, the strong base we've built um, and really start to, to, to expand our, our impact. One of the most gratifying things I think about Glyconet has been we've, we've really brought in people from all over the country and people who who are not card-carrying glycobiologists or glyco glycoscientists. And so uh, that's been really impactful, important. And Carla Williams is a good example of that, uh, who uh, sort of came in from another area. Lori West is another example of that, who, who a transplant biologist or, or immunologist who's now is pretty conversant in carbohydrate chemistry, although she probably will dispute that. <laughs> so anyway, that's really what I wanted to say. And I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you. Yes. 
I'd now like to introduce uh, Dr. Mona Namer. She was appointed Chief Science Officer for the Government of Canada a little over a year ago. Uh, she's former VP Research at the University of Ottawa and a professor of biochemistry, microbiology, and immunology in the Faculty of Medicine at Ottawa U, and has received many honours throughout her career. Although I don't know if she saw Chief Science Advisor coming, but uh, it's here now and we're all happy that it is. Uh, Dr. Namer is going to outline briefly what the, where the major science platforms are heading and how an area like glycomics might fit. Dr. Namer. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. So uh, before I start uh, talking about uh, major uh, science facilities and where we're, we're heading, I just want to remind everyone that I actually did my PhD in sort of sugar chemistry. I actually did nucleoside chemistry. And uh, um, we, we didn't, we thought of sugars as modified nucleosides, actually. And so <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, I think, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Glyconet for all the achievements in a really short period of time, and uh, also want to congratulate the government of uh, Alberta for their foresight and their support of, uh, I guess, initially, you know, the Glycomics uh, group or network, and uh, that has really paved uh, the way for Glyconet. And yes, sugars are important in life, and they're important for infections, and they're important for autoimmunity, and they're Im important for all sorts of uh, small drugs to fight uh, diseases and uh, perhaps epigenetics and everything else. So I think we need to start thinking uh, about them maybe the same way we've uh, been thinking about genomics and the proteomics and all the omics. And the, though you went from glycomics to glyconet, you know, the omics is still there. And I think the omics is uh, even more important. So, um, so I, I think that um, it's interesting to see how uh, we think of major science platforms. Glyconet is a platform. It's a great platform to bring people uh, together, but uh, focused on a specific area to commercialize it, to provide um, some seed funding and uh, uh, intellectual and uh, technical support uh, for this to happen. So I think over the years, uh, our notions of platforms has changed a lot. And uh, in, in biosciences, it's been actually quite fascinating because we used to think of uh, physicists as the ones needing large facilities. Well, um, biologists now need cyclotrons. <laughs> biologists now need uh, large data. Uh, biologists now need uh, uh, all sorts of uh, 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 infrastructure that is virtual or that is in one physical location or that is uh, dispersed. Um, we're, we're carrying out uh, experiments in space. Uh, space stations now are platforms for uh, biosciences. So um, I think this is, it's, it's really important that uh, when we think of the bioscience areas that we make sure that we have everything that we need to take it from the uh, basic science all the way to a commercial product. And in Canada, we have a, um, I, I guess, a, uh, we haven't capitalized enough on our uh, strength in uh, medicine, in biosciences, uh, and uh, can I say in glycomics uh, as well that are so relevant to so many areas. And we need to ask the questions, why? Is it that we don't have the right programs? Is it that we don't have the right infrastructures? Is it that we don't have the proper um, timelines uh, for you know, all these different programs? And I think that collectively we need to reflect on this because if we don't do this, um, no one else will, will, uh, will do it. And um, we, we need to make sure that uh, biosciences are you know, in the coming years what artificial intelligence is right now to Canada a sense of uh, great uh, national pride, but also putting us uh, among the top five nations in the world in, uh, in this uh, disruptive uh, technology, being able to uh, not only have capacity building around it, but also commercialize it, use it, and attract investments from outside. And there is a huge potential 
uh, uh, around the biosciences. I think that uh, uh, Minister Baines, the Minister of uh, uh, what we used to call industry, but is uh, innovation, science, and economic development, has spoken to that, that we have uh, lots of potential in biosciences and that we need to capitalize on it. And I think Alberta is a um, really well positioned uh, to do this. And uh, Glyconet is uh, one of those uh, great platforms and Glycomics uh, should be as well one of them. So I guess that's what I have to say and I look forward to the panel and to questions. Thank you. So panel, would you like to uh, take a seat? I had this idea that you'd be in a certain order, but I've just abandoned that idea. It, it'll be fine. I'll introduce those that you haven't met yet once they're seated. So closest to me, Dr. Lori West. She's director of the Alberta Transplant Center, also director of the Canadian National Transplant Research Program. She's a professor of pediatric surgery and immunology here at the U of A and a tier one Canada research chair in cardiac transplantation. And transplantation, of course, is an issue where uh, glycomics plays a huge role because the recognition of self and non-self is tied up with those uh, molecules. Uh, next to her, uh, Dr. Lowry, we've met him. Uh, next to her is, uh, oh God, here we go. I, 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 met Car I met Carla Williams, and that's who it is, uh, just a minute, a minute or two ago. She's particularly interested in the detection and diagnosis of cancer and metastatic spread of cancers. But she's on the panel as well because she is co-founder of Glyca Biosciences, a startup company that grew out of Glyconet-funded uh, research and uh, is particularly interested in tests like high-risk prostate cancer blood tests. And part of the reason that we've selected the people we have on the panel is to give you a sense not just of the science, and the breadth of the science, but also the opportunities that exist for um, glycomic scientists. Aram Razvi is next. She's a trainee, which is kind of a not very, what, not very glamorous way of saying she's doing a PhD in Toronto uh, at the U of T in the hospital for sick children. She <laughs> She's working with um, biofilms, many bacterial species develop films that are very hard to dislodge and hard to eradicate, and uh, she's working particularly with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, common infection of, bo of burn wounds, and also a real difficulty for uh, people with cystic fibrosis. Dr. Namer, you've met, and at the end, Dr. Uh, David Vocadlo. He's, as we mentioned before, a uh, professor of chemistry so you can already see, we have cardiac specialists, you have chemists here. Um, at Department of Chemistry at Simon Fraser, he is also a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Chemical Glycobiology. So that's your panel. Um, I would, the way we're going to do this is they are just going to speak. I'm not asking them any questions. And why don't we start at this end with Dr. Laurie West. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I uh, will tell you a little bit about what I do. As you can see, I am actually not a chemist. Uh, I'm trained in pediatric cardiology. I take care of children who need heart transplants or who have had heart transplants. So why am I sitting here uh, talking with carbohydrate chemists? Well, the opportunity uh, came now about 20 years ago when we did a heart transplant that was totally against the accepted principles of the time. And that was to, because babies uh, are at very high risk of dying without a heart transplant for those who need it. And we were compelled to, generally speaking, not cross blood groups, that blood groups had to match between the donors and the recipients because blood group structures, which are sugars, are expressed on the organs that we transplant, including the heart. So this is a formidable barrier in heart transplantation, but, but through beginning to think about these sugars in particular, the blood group sugars, we uh, identified the fact, we discovered that babies actually don't have 
the antibodies that cause this, this terrible uh, rejection of mismatched organs. And so we carried out uh, the first heart transplant in blood group mismatched babies um, now 21 years ago. That boy is now 21 years old. Uh, and we carried on, we carried on uh, with a cohort of 10 patients. This has now really changed pediatric heart transplantation around the world. Um, these, this is now accepted practice virtually around the world. But that, and that was just tremendously exciting and gratifying because now many more patients could be transplanted by understanding or beginning to understand the science related to the sugars uh, from a medical person, from a non-scientist. But then scientifically, it became as exciting as the, the, the children were impacted. We then began, when I came to then to the University of Alberta, and I was told, well, you need to speak to Todd Lowry, because he knows everything about sugars. And <laughs> we started a conversation that became one of the most exciting collaborations that I've had in my career, and has gone on what, for a decade now, I guess, where we brought our students together, um, we brought our teams together, and you know, in, in medicine, pediatrics, cardiology, immunology, and chemistry, we started this conversation around the table. And we had to find a common language, because my students didn't understand those bonds and structures and things. Well, frankly, neither did I. But um, and, and, and Todd's students and trainees would look at us and say, really, you do a heart transplant in a four-hour-old child? That's cool. And then, you know, so it began to grow and grow. But it illustrates the amazing synergies that are possible when you have these team structures that can bring people together and, and find those synergies that they wouldn't have had the chance to to develop or explore otherwise. And I think that's a, a re, it's really a nice story about what these interactive structures, as Mona has mentioned, can bring together AI, cl clinical things, scientific things, and maybe the, it's the structure of Canada that contributes to that because the vast geography compels us to find creative, collaborative ways. Thank you. Okay? You can just pat. It's, uh, Dr. Lowry, I didn't uh, say anything about you when you came up this time because I had introduced you before. But you're, you don't have to talk about the history of glyconat now. You can no, talk I, about I your science. That, 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 that I, my own PhD thesis was in the area of the APO blood group antigens in terms of looking at the enzymes that put them together. And those of you who've been around Edmonton for a long time may remember a company called Chembiomed, uh, which was back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, it was a technology, it was a company built around, again, trying to improve heart trans, uh, blood transfusions, which again was based around the blood group antigens. And so, so my own, my own research is focused in the area of, of microbial glycans. And so, um, most of what we've done over the, the last 20 years of my career has been focused on mycobacteria. And the most famous example of that is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. These, these organisms produce very strange sugar structures that intrigued us chemically. Um, but then it also occurred to us that these would probably were also very important to the to the progression of the of the, of the organism, and so we've spent a years trying to develop chemistry to make these molecules. And now we've really moved into a phase of of our research that we're actually using these as part of collaborations with other groups. And so one of the more recent things that was a bit of news around is we're working with companies who are are trying to develop better diagnostics for for, for the, the disease. And so what we've been able to do is to take the the basic research we've done to make molecules uh, and then apply it to a very uh, important problem um, and working with sort of international leaders in the field. And uh, this has been really tremendously exciting. And I think, uh, really, I think we're at a stage, at least in this particular diagnostic problem, that we actually will make a real real, real, real world impact on, 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 on diagnosing TB. And this is not a disease that, that has ever gone away. And it's also not a disease that's not of a concern to people in Alberta. Uh, the indigenous communities in the north are, are affected with, with TB. Uh, it's also an important uh, agricultural disease and that, that you have problems with bovine tuberculosis in, in often. And uh, at this point, the only treatment for bovine TB is to kill a herd of animals, basically, because that's the only way that you, that you treat them. So I think that's, I think, hopefully give you another sort of flavor for the sorts of ways in which carbohydrate chemistry can actually, and biology can actually impact uh, real world problems. So my um, path that kind of led me towards here stems similar to Lori's in that um, I'm a classically an oncology researcher and became interested in glycomics through the Canadian glycomics community and through interactions with people who were really passionate about sugars and started looking at that in my own work and looking at how different types of sugars are present on cancer cells. And then with the 
idea of uh, thinking, well, can we detect these and can we use them as a new platform for finding cancers early or determining if a cancer is aggressive? And we know that uh, sh cells are coated in these sugars. We also know that cancer cells are coated in different sugars. And so by knowing what these sugars are, um, we can find them in the blood of patients or people, and we can determine whether or not they uh, tell us whether or not someone has an aggressive cancer. So we started looking into this, and we started finding these present in the blood on these small fragments. So tumor cells are constantly shedding little bits of themselves into the bloodstream, and we can see they're decorated in different sugars than a healthy cell from the, uh, fragment from the prostate would be. And so by looking at these, we started to see that they were elevated in people who actually had a really aggressive prostate cancer. And so we moved forward into looking at a lot of clinical samples and seeing that we could really detect people who needed to get in for treatment. And we know specifically for prostate cancer that current methods are um, not ideal and we have a lot of overdiagnosis. So we, we moved forward um, through these Glyconet uh, funded projects and we looked to take it to the next level, which is commercialization, because we wanted to get it out there to the people. We wanted to benefit the community. And so that led us to the development of uh, intellectual property. Um, and the company that uh, has kind of spun off of this, which is Glyco Biosciences, and we've been building that with the idea that we're looking at sugars in blood and it's gonna tell us something about someone's state of health. And we've uh, driven this forward a lot through interactions and through the Canadian glycomics uh, community. And so it's been, it's been a good journey that's led here. So hi, my name is Aram, and um, as Jay mentioned, I'm a trainee, so a PhD student. Um, so the, my project falls under the infectious disease topic. So in terms of glycomics and infectious disease, there's sort of two areas where you could uh, look at. So infectious disease, meaning specifically pertaining to either um, bacterial or fungal infections. So there are many projects um, that are funded by Glyconet that either look at um, how to target the cell wall of bacteria. And what's really interesting about bacteria is in that cell wall, you actually, it's predominantly composed mostly of sugars. And if you don't have those sugars in that cell wall, you actually cause the cells to collapse and die. And so one of the reasons to look into that is because, um, as many of you may know, antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance is on the rise, and we need to start coming up with um, sort of new and novel ways um, to tackle these various infectious diseases. Um, but the other area, which is what, where my project falls into, is um, looking at bacterial biofilms. So um, some of you may not know what those are. So typically, we think of bacteria as freely, swoting, freely swimming cells. But um, in nature, bacteria don't actually exist like that. They typically aggregate and clump together, and they actually talk to each other and secrete various molecules and sort of make this slime. And what's really cool is that in this slime, um, a big component of this is, are actually sugars. Um, so what my project actually looks at, and for me personally, I really enjoy my project because um, it combines my love for microbiology and sugars. Like, I like to bake <laughs> and things like that <laughs> in a different way. Um, but uh, when I first started my project, um, my PI, Dr. Lynn Howell, was mentioning to me, okay, we have this project, and in what my project would do and look at specifically was at, the, at a bacterium being able to make this sugar molecule, what, we, what was found was that if you stop that sugar molecule from being made, um, you no longer have a biofilm. And that's really amazing because um, when, you, when the bacteria sort of come together and make this biofilm, they can become up to a thousand times more tolerant to antibiotics. So the idea of my project is to sort of look at how can we, um, as understanding how the sugar molecule is actually made by the bacteria. And I've actually been involved in a screening process where I've identified and working towards identifying a small molecule that can actually prevent the sugar from being released by the bacteria. And so you don't have a biofilm anymore. Um, and so that would render antibiotics to be more um, effective. And I would just like to add that um, as a trainee being part of Glyconet, it's been a great experience. Um, I've been able to uh, attend a great conference every year in Banff, and at that conference, there's a bunch of professional development workshops which have helped me to develop my soft skills. Um, there, is, there was a great communications workshop led by Jay himself. Um, I've got to hear from people in various different um, career fields from project management, industry, and academia. 
And I've also got to meet and network with many great scientists. Who are, a lot of them are in this audience today, which is great to see a bunch of familiar faces. Um, I've also got to uh, work on organizing and planning the conference. And again, I've got to work with great scientists who are here today. And um, it's been a great experience and, and journey to be part of a Glycogonet funded project and the Glycogonet as a whole. Thank you. So if I may, I'm actually going to talk about my science because I, yes. I, I, I do have a lab and I, I, do, I do science. And I'm just so glad that Laurie, you spoke about the heart because uh, I work on the heart. And uh, the, 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 there are, you know, we all know that you, you, the, the two biggest uh, killers are cancer and heart disease. And, um, you know, we think that we can overcome heart disease, but in fact, there's something called heart failure. And heart failure is a terminal disease, and uh, its uh, prognosis is actually worse than many cancers. So when someone is diagnosed with, uh, with heart failure, it's like an irreversible disease. There's no um, medication uh, right now, and uh, the, the, the chances of survival are uh, for less than five years. So uh, in my lab, we, we actually try to understand how the heart functions, to try to understand why it actually fails. And one of the b big problems with the heart is that it doesn't regenerate itself. So the heart cells that contract don't regenerate like skin cells or even uh, neurons and others. So if the, when they die, it's actually quite detrimental. And many things can kill these cells, uh, including chemotherapy, including uh, atherosclerosis, high blood pressure. Many of us will be inflicted with this. So we need to protect uh, the heart and make sure that these cells continue surviving. Well, these cells, for them to survive, they actually need energy. And sugar metabolism is very important uh, in the heart. So we have to remember that uh, you know, sugar is actually good for you. Sometimes you know, too much of it is not good. But and in disease, actually, sugar metabolism is greatly disrupted. It's disrupted in cancer, and that's why you know, the, 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 the cells can actually survive on their own uh, nutrients. And it's disrupted also in the heart and in heart failure. So essentially, we had uh, identified pathways that will make the cardiac cells uh, survive. And um, you, that was, uh, of course, very exciting. But then we had to develop really small molecules that target these pathways. And uh, you know perhaps these molecules would be cardioprotective. So this is when we teamed up with um, um, a, a chemist, Yvonne Gandon, sitting over there in the audience, and uh, became part of a Glyconet-funded uh, uh, project that allowed us to take this, um, you know, basic uh, observation and finding and discovery, and try to move it into a better treatment uh, for for patients. So, in in the course of this, we uh, indeed uh, discovered molecules that are uh, good for the heart, and others that are actually um, good for cancer cells, meaning that uh, they kill them. So, um, the, w without killing the uh, the other cells, we're able to develop some uh, patents uh, around this. And um, more importantly than, than where we're taking this, uh, because we are pursuing this, we want to, to take it to better care, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, see trainees in two distinct fields, uh, chemistry on the one hand, and then uh, pharmacology, uh, physiology, molecular biology on the other, that were coming together, working together, and starting to understand the vocabulary of each other, the tools uh, of each other. And just imagine these, uh, these young uh, researchers, they're, they're just like the, the dream um, workforce for the pharmaceutical industry, for the biotech industry, for, for, for hospitals, for numerous other places. So I think that we need to keep in mind how important the training aspect, the multidisciplinary aspect, these platforms that bring these different disciplines. Um, yes, we start company. Yes, we develop new drugs. And that's very important. We all want to do it. But if we don't manage to do this successfully, at least we're managing to, um, to train properly the next generation of leaders who 
may well have a better chance than us of creating wealth and of creating uh, these uh, new drugs and, and making health better. So that's, that's what I'd like to say. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, Jay gave a great overview, and, and my background is chemical biology. I'm a chemical biologist, and so I think about the cell, and I think about life. I, I think about structures and pictures like this, particularly chemical structures of proteins and biomolecules like DNA and lipids and carbohydrates, and I think about how they interact with each other in a dynamic way to enable life. And ultimately, that brings me to think about what goes wrong in diseases. So what is actually happening with these structures to make them dysfunctional within the cell? And uh, then as a chemical biologist, I think about developing chemical tools by which we can monitor these processes and, and, and intervene for the benefit of, of human health and disease. So I, I, my story really starts off, I guess when I finished my undergraduate degree, I, I got fired up about chemical biology of carbohydrates. And it was because I think in, in undergraduate, studies, I didn't really hear much about carbohydrates. I think, as, as Mona pointed out, you know, the idea of carbohydrates and glucose as a metabolite and being important in central metabolism is clear. But not much else was explained at that time. So when I worked as a technician for a couple of years, I was fortunate to work in a couple of really talented glycoscience labs. And then there were three things that really got me fired up about the whole topic. One of them, I think Jay pointed out, was that every single cell from every kingdom of life, right from bacteria, through to humans are decorated with carbohydrates. And secondly, it's not just one type of carbohydrate. So for example, in humans, there's 10 different carbohydrates. Just like in proteins, there's 20 different amino acids. And in DNA, there's four different bases. So these 10 different carbohydrates then combine in different ways to form these elaborate structures. Clearly, they're encoding information. But, but what does the cell do with this information? What does an organism do with it? And that was a fascinating question to me. So thirdly, not much was known at the time. You know, I, I started reading journals and, and talking to people, and it was, a, it was a big mystery, actually, in many cases. And so I kind of started thinking about carbohydrates as the dark matter of the cell <laughs> in biology. And I thought, this is a great area. We, we need more research in this area. And we need chemical tools to work out what is going on, what are the problems caused by these structures. So when I started my lab at Simon Fraser University, I decided to focus on the chemical biology of carbohydrates and the development of new chemical tools and biochemical tools that we could use to understand these structures in human health and disease. And then I combine that with a particular focus on neurodegenerative diseases. And this is because really neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, they're devastating illnesses. I think a lot of us have personal experience with our families or our, our colleagues and friends who may suffer from these dreadful diseases. And there's no treatments that are available that can slow or stop the progression of these ailments. And so what we decided to do was set out to understand the potential roles of carbohydrates in these diseases. And our first project was to understand how a particular carbohydrate could influence proteins within the cell and block the formation of these toxic clumps of protein that accumulate within the brain and cause Alzheimer's. And ultimately, we were able to understand the fundamental processes regulating enzymes that modify this key protein known as tau that forms these clumps. And we're able to use those compounds to show in transgenic mouse models of Alzheimer's disease that we could prevent this pathology from occurring. So we then went off and we set up a, a spin-off company, which ultimately partnered with Merck. And is, together, they've taken those forward into clinical trials in phase one, where they've been shown to be generally well tolerated. So this is pretty exciting. And recently, with Glyconet support, We've been really enthusiastically pursuing the greatest genetic risk factor for Parkinson's disease, which turns out to be an enzyme that cuts a carbohydrate off of a particular lipid within the brain. And so with this funding, we've set out to develop chemical tools by which we can monitor the levels of this enzyme within the human brain. And we're working with medical biophysicists and radiochemists to do this. Following on that, we're also developing chemical tools that allow us to watch this enzyme in action within living cells. We can then use those tools to identify molecules by screening to find compounds that increase the activity of this enzyme and may potentially have the ability to slow or stop the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So we're really excited about that. And a number of different partners, including the Michael J. Fox Foundation and a number of other pharmaceutical companies, along with the support of Glyconet, 
we've been working towards partnering with these organizations and accelerating this research with the idea of developing new potential therapeutics and, and diagnostics. And so I think, you know, we're at the point in time where now carbohydrates and glycomics are at a stage where a lot of groundwork has been developed through the efforts of many people around the world <laughs> to advance the field and create new opportunities to intervene for the benefit of human health and disease. And I think it's an incredibly exciting time, and I'm just happy to be part of it, along with Glyconet. No Great. longer the dark matter. That's hopefully not. <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of dark matter there, thankfully. <laughs> Thank you all, panel. Um, we've set aside time. Honestly, I could listen to this panel for another hour, but don't think we're entitled to do that. Um, but if any of you have questions, we have two people with microphones at either side. Uh, we'd like you to not just shout, but actually use the microphone for recording purposes. Um, so just raise your hand, we'll get a mic to you. But of course, I get to ask a question first, which is, and this may not be answerable, but every, just about every one of you uh, touched on the idea of collaboration and the importance of it. So I'd like to ask the chemists, well, each of you take your own point of view, but having been exposed to the science that you weren't actually starting with, has it changed the way you think? So if you're a chemist and you're exposed to biology, does it change the way you approach your chemistry? And you seem really interested in this, David, so I'm gonna ask you. Well, a absolutely. I mean, I, I think that we, as scientists, it's, it's imperative that we pay attention to the world around us, including our intellectual community of, of scientists in different disciplines, because ultimately that's what inspires our work. We have to look to these other fields to derive insight and ultimately to guide our choice of projects and focus on issues that are important to the world and issues that are ultimately going to uncover fundamental new knowledge, which is the bedrock of any translational research. So we have to identify those key questions. And we can only do that with colleagues from many different areas. Any other comments on that? Well, I did my PhD in chemistry, as I said, and after that, I um, did a postdoc in molecular biology. The reason I, I was going to go back to chemistry, it took me a long route, and thanks to Glyconet, to go back to chemistry. But um, I wanted to understand, to better understand biology, to be able to target the drugs. I, I think I'm just being from outside the field has always given me a different, you know, outlook and uh, on, on things. Number one, it, it's good when you don't know enough, to, so you're fearless. It's it's just because you're <laughs> ignorant. <Yeah. laughs> uh, that's number one. Um, number two, um, you, you get a sort of uh, a crude sensitivity to language, language barrier among disciplines. Um, the other thing is, you don't have, you know, so you do this already differently. You, you do your science differently. But, um, you, you know, you don't need to, uh, all interdisciplinarity does not have to reside in, in one person. Right. I think this is where you're, you're much, um, you know, better prepared to collaborate because you can express the needs in such a way that, you know, the other uh, person from a different field can actually uh, follow, can understand. And I think that we have a huge problem with, with language uh, ba barrier. I, I think we can say this among biologists, among chemists, among uh, um, you know, all fields. And we need to just like train uh, our uh, students and uh, provide opportunities for our researchers of all levels to engage in multidisciplinarity. Uh, Carla, could I ask you, a sp is, so th the two answers so far have dealt with the scientists working with other scientists, but in a startup situation, uh, what, how important is the role of bringing in diverse people to that? So for the startup side, you need people who actually know how to do a startup, which <laughs> <laughs> if you're a biologist, it's not you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of people who are startup starters and don't know how to do it either. <laughs> so that's actually where Glyconet came in as a huge resource because they had the skills, they had people who had the business expertise and kind of, and helped guide through some of those important steps to to take things to the next level. Because we, as a scientist, you always really want your your research to have impact, but it's it's hard to get it out there 
to give it that impact. And so having people involved who actually know the uh, the side of patenting and 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 the side of the uh, the development of the business is really important because otherwise we would just all stay in the lab and uh, have our projects uh, stirring in there and they'd never make it to the people. <laughs> Question? Anybody? So, um, so just so just building on that. Um, uh, many of you have had some experience in the commercialization process, and I think Mona mentioned um, uh, either now or earlier, I can't remember, um, uh, that there's a suite of um, supports that you need to be able to do that successfully. And so I'm wondering if anyone would like to comment on what some of the gaps might be, either provincially or nationally in that regard. Um, well... Probably you're better to, able to address the. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah go no mind. I, th I think I think there's I think the both the provincial. I mean, I also should say I should have said earlier that that all of our success would not have been possible uh, without funding agencies that supported us and, and 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 universities that supported us and said, okay, this is an important area. You need to build this up, and we're going to support you both with money and with 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 emotional support, for lack of a better word. Um, <laughs> And so I think the federal government and the provincial government is well intended often, but I think often because of lack of, of, of funding or, or lack of information, often many of the programs that are put in place uh, either don't do what they hope or hope to do uh, or become passe because things have changed over the years. And uh, um, this came up in an earlier meeting today, but I think you know the, the U.S. has done a pretty good job at things of funding startups through, through the SBIR program. Canada doesn't have something like that. I mean, they have they have much smaller things that, that frankly don't have the, the sort of funding behind them that that is needed to be successful so that's an example where I mean this sort of trying to convert something from from uh, you know a, a pretty good sort of proof of concept in the lab that you can get supported by the various funding mechanisms and then getting enough supporting data that's actually going to get a venture capitalist interested or, or an angel investor interested in this that's huge and 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 glycan is trying to fill some of that gap but but that's, a, I think, is a, a major gap. And so David, David really has more experience in this, this sort of area than I do. So I'll, I'll turn it over to him for his views. Well, I, I mean, I think that that's a really good summary. One of the, the one of the points I would raise is that what's really critical is that continuity of funding, because the conversion of ideas into ultimately products that can be translated for for benefit of human health, uh, it, it's a long road. It's incredibly tough and, and difficult, and it requires partnerships, and it requires sustained support from funding organizations at a range of different levels. And, and that ecosystem is so important to maintain till you get to the point where you're actually able to partner with an industrial partner or you're able to secure funding from venture capitalists. It's just a long, tough road. I mean, okay. as a researcher and an academic administrator, I, I saw the gaps uh, throughout, uh, actually, the system. It's not just one place. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about the biologists who think they can start companies. Uh, the, the, yeah, we, we don't have enough people with science expertise who are, who are lawyers, who are business developers, who understand the language, uh, again, and the field. Um, that's one thing. The other thing, when we when you start taking a patent, first of all, it costs a lot of money. Certainly, your CIHR grant does not support this. Uh, the budget of the university would probably support, you know, what two, three uh, patents uh, a year, new patents, if you were to maintain them. Uh, but le let's say that you manage to get the patent. Well, the the clock start ticking. And before you get a venture capitalist interested in putting money in, or the Merck, or, or Glaxo, or whoever, there are a number of things that need to be done, and done quickly. And these are not projects for graduate students. So you need to have the professionals uh, who are doing them professionally and quickly. So this is another funding gap. And this is where I think networks uh, can be helpful because there's an immediacy and some flexibility in terms of, of the funds. But um, I think that you know, universities, if they had you know, the, the appropriate funding for the commercialization and the translation, would also be able to do it. I, I think uh, if I could yeah. just add to that, um, if you're starting, so we talk about bench to bedside to commercialization to impact and so on, but if you're starting at the bedside, and you see a problem, rather than trying to 
develop a pathway, you're actually coming back and trying to solve a problem. Uh, you need the same tools and the same, uh, you need access to all of these same things, but with the added complexity that um, you, you have to sometimes figure out what exactly what the problem is based on a clinical need. Um, and it can, and, and so it's really not just unidirectional. And I think we sometimes forget that it isn't just going in one direction of development, that the, that the whole pathway to impact and ideally to commercialization and so on and all that has to be uh, a circle uh, that can start anywhere in the process. And we have to have the facility and the, the, the flexibility to be able to enter that cycle and add those pathways and those tools and those sustainability um, factors <coughs> in any place along the cycle. Uh, Lori, could I ask you a, a science question about transplantation? Because it seems to me that over the last 35 or 40 years, there have been huge strides made in transplanting organs, preventing rejection. So, you know, at this point in 2018, what would you say are is a major goal that is yet unattained or a major hurdle that you'd like to see overcome? Well, the, the, t the two main hurdles... Um, in transplantation in general of cells and organs are that we don't have enough transplants, we don't have enough uh, donated organs and tissues, and we can't, and transplantation isn't a cure. So our goal is to make transplantation a cure, really, it's, it's a chronic disease after a transplant, it's a chronic lifelong disease, but it could be a cure if we could solve uh, some of the immune-related issues, and if we could generate enough um, multi-complex um, pathways to meet the demand that there is out there, then we could have an impact on an, an estimate, worldwide estimate of probably two million individuals per year, um, including cells that could be used for the treatment of autoimmune diseases as a cellular transplant and so on. So where does glycomics fit into this? Um, one way that we can try and solve the donor problem is to make donor organs, to make organ donors um, uh, um, able to be used by any recipient so that the matching process isn't quite as onerous. And that's some of the work that we've been doing with Glyconet, um, new collaborations, in fact, with David's group and ongoing with Todd's group, where we look at actually using enzymes to cleave off some of the sugars that would make that would make organs kind of universal donor organs, if you like. And because there are some amazing new machines that can now uh, help organs survive outside the body. You may have seen of some of these, this, these uh, uh, organ in a box kind of things. That gives us the uh, uh, possibility of using some of these glycomics treatments, as it were, to treat organs outside the body to make them ideal for transplantation. Um, the, the whole field, and I think you started it off when you, you talked about proteins, you know, glycoimmunology uh, is really catching up to, to everything in immunology has been built around protein understanding for years and years and years. But now uh, we see moving into the world of transplantation an understanding of the importance of the evolving field of glycoimmunology in a way that I think will help us solve some of these long problems. Boy, you moved your hand. I thought it was a question. It's, this is like an auction. Anybody twitches, I'm going to pick them out. I just won the bid. Yay. Uh, so I think this might be a question for maybe David or Carla. I'm just wondering, um, is, are you close, either one of your, your, you know, in your studies, to, say, a diagnostic tool that is carbohydrate-based or maybe a therapy that's carbohydrate-based? Oh, okay. Or maybe Todd. It's for diagnostics. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the work we've done recently is basically improving a, a clinically used assay, which is, is it just under, doesn't work well, it underperforms. And so by, by the research that we've done with, with the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics, we've actually been able to increase the sensitivity and selectivity of the assay remarkably to the point that, I mean, FIND is, is pushing this very hard now. FIND is a, is a Gates-affiliated NGO. And so, and the Gates, as you're aware, is a big interest in TV. So, I mean, I think there's a real advantage or opportunity there to really make an impact. Um, we're working, continuing to work with them on trying to develop better reagents, basically, for this assay, with the idea, with the hope that we can we can make this uh, even better. But I'll turn it over to these two for. If you want to sure. work on diagnostics. Yeah. yeah so uh, um, we've been moving towards that for. Uh, 
coming up with a better test for prostate cancer so that we're detecting people who actually need treatment rather than now we're sending a lot of people in for invasive uh, biopsies when they don't really need them. Um, and um, with the, the test is, we've got a really good sensitivity for the test and we've done a lot of patient samples. And so now it's, it's the matter of um, de developing it a little bit further to really bring in some outside interest from a larger commercial entity that could uh, produce it at a level that can be distributed commercially. So um, we really hope to keep making progress on it. And then uh, we do have a bit of a therapeutic side, which is actually one of our partner fundings that comes from the Department of Defense. And um, we think that as well as being a diagnostic tool, the, we could also look at targeting um, cancer cells by looking, by, by attacking these abnormal sugars that are on the cells. So we hope to make progress with that too. Hey, Aram, I have a question for you. You're doing biofilms right now but you're surrounded by people who started in one thing and then switched to another. So do you have a sort of career path that you're looking at? You mean like currently right now, where do I see yeah, myself? Yeah, like right now, today, oh, right at you know, six o'clock. <laughs> you know, it's actually funny because <laughs> I actually was just thinking that, like listening to everybody talk about their, their research, I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool too. <laughs> but it's all like the, the linkage and, and commonality between it all is, is uh, sugars. So, I mean, it's tough to say because I, I love science in general, but I do have a soft spot in my heart for sugars specifically just because I think... Um, they're just very fascinating and interesting and, and like um, Todd was saying and, and David um, Just you know, there's there's only not that many sugars, but when you combine them together They can make all sorts of various kinds of molecules um, But I mean me being a PhD student. I think the common um, pathway that is mentioned is to go into academia um, But there's also industry as well, too. Um, I'm thinking more of the industry side, but I don't know yet I'm I'm still I'm not done my PhD you gotta always keep your doors open and and it's events like this where I can meet some other people get some idea of what other people do but that's, that's why we need bioscience industries <laughs> <laughs> if I could maybe just come back quickly to the question that was asked about about a drug or a diagnostic there are carbohydrate based drugs that are that are used if you've ever taken tamiflu for for the flu that's a carbohydrate based drug uh, there are drugs that are available for for diabetes precoce uh, is, a, is a carbohydrate based drug so these these do exist anticoagulants. and any exactly anticoagulants heparin the the um, what's it called fondaparinol yeah. is is a, is a carbohydrate based drug Hey, David, there's a, oh, sorry, Lori, were you no, going to, well, yeah, I was go. just going to add, in, in terms of diagnostics as well, um, the way we currently look at, the, the, the current gold standard around the world to look at antibodies in the bloodstream directed to uh, ABO blood groups is the same that was described more than 120 years ago, but now we're able to develop, uh, be, because I, when I came here, you know, these guys said, oh, those sugars, yeah, we have lots of those. We have buckets of those. We have, we can, David Bundles had them in the freezer for 20 years now. We, we have lots of these things. But look, we can hook them to things. We can, we can attach them to, to this bead or to that, or to that structure and we can color it this way and make it big or small. And to me, this was magic, just magic that you could actually work with these things. And, and so now we've developed a diagnostic together uh, that is, is poised to move forward um, and have an impact uh, because it will now bring finesse and precision and accuracy to uh, a, a, a ridiculously outdated um, and flawed test. Um, and that's a great new advance that uh, you can do with working together this way. Sorry, I got a little excited. <laughs> <laughs> so David, there's a, a strand of thinking about Alzheimer's that it's an insulin dysregulation. Do you buy that as a major competitor, you know, against amyloid and tau and as a mechanism? Well, I mean, I, I would say that they're not necessarily exclusive. So, you know, doubt, yeah. So animals that are diabetic um, are at much great increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, you know, as are humans, of course. And so it, it's thought in many cases that a dysfunctional uh, glucose metabolism within the brain is a contributor to the trigger, which is generally thought to be amyloid, as well as the bullet, which is thought to be the tau pathology and the tau oligomers that spread throughout the brain. So the two are, are not really incompatible at all. And in fact, um, maintaining healthy lifestyle uh, in terms of heart 
and uh, body mass index is really one of the best things one can do to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's uh, and Parkinson's, particularly Alzheimer's. It's thought that about 50% of Alzheimer's is uh, attributable to, to these lifestyle risk factors and could be avoided with improved uh, lifestyle practices. Of course, you know, there, there is the genetic lottery, of course, too. And there are a number of different genetic risk factors. And so those who ultimately go on to develop Alzheimer's, um, some people are just in incredibly unlucky. You know, it doesn't matter what they do. So. Yeah. Well, on the subject of funding for uh, research and startups, we Calgarians might vote down the Olympics, and that'll free up a whole bunch of money. <laughs> which of course we think will go to medical research. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to please let's acknowledge a really fabulous panel. Thank you.